Okay, welcome my friends to the next episode here in the Red Delta Project podcast and live feed Q&A here on the Red Delta Project YouTube channel. Yes, we're finally back after many weeks of just having one thing after another come up that's prevented me from doing these live feeds. Um, finally back to normal weekend schedules. So here we are. We are ready to rock and roll. And as always, this episode is brought to you by the sponsors for Red Delta Project. We've got everything lined up today. We got the RDP library, including the Grind Style Calisthenics series with the new book that just came out, Progressive and Weighted Calisthenics for Building Muscle and Strength. And of course, uh, the equipment manufacturers I recommend all back behind me there, NOS Suspension Training, Duonomic Doorway, Pull-Up Units and Rings, which I always highly recommend if you don't have a decent pull-up bar. Links to all those things are down below. And of course, I've got reviews on all that equipment on the channel as well. So let's dive right in. We've got a good topic today on building confidence. This is one of the things that uh, may not seem like it's that much related to fitness, but I think fundamentally it really is because why do we want to be in better shape? A lot of times we come into the world of, I want to exercise, I want to lose weight and stuff in order to feel better about ourselves, more confident in our own skin. And there's a lot more to confidence than just building biceps and losing weight because a lot of times people do achieve a higher level of fitness and nothing happens as far as how they feel about themselves. They're still feeling relatively uh, insecure in social settings. And they're like, well, I thought that people would have more respect for me or that I'd be more attractive to the people I wanted to be attractive to. And that's not happening and stuff. And the answer to that, of course, is that confidence is like a modern day superpower. Uh, poll after poll, and you ask people what's the most attractive uh, quality in a lot of people, and they'll say confidence, self-assuredness, being able to handle your own stuff, as it were. And unfortunately, these days, our confidence is even more under attack due to per persuasive marketing, social media tactics, lots of things out there telling you you're not good enough, you don't have what it takes, and it just kind of beats us down. And there's even more subtle ways that I'll explain in short order here on ways that it is eroding our self-confidence, even though trying to sell us products and services that are supposed to bolster self-confidence. So I got my tea here right now. We got folks coming on in. Dave is here, Sniff Rat. Michael, Dave uh, uh, are, is uh, coming in hot. And uh, as always, folks, if you put a hay mat in the... Uh, the comment section that I know that's something directed to me for questions, which I'll be answering throughout here. All right. So the first thing to know about building confidence, and by the way, I should preface this with saying that I've suffered from low self-esteem and worthiness issues and stuff most of my entire life. And over the past, I would say three or four years, my confidence level has been growing steadily and progressively over the past well, like I said, three or four years at a regular clip. It's never been something that automatically changed and suddenly I was more confident. It's something that's built up over time. And so the first thing to recognize about building confidence is that it is something that is first and foremost earned. It is not something we can hack. It's not something that you can, you know, have a confident pose and confident body language when and you're in a social setting and suddenly you'll have more confidence kind of thing. It is something that is built and earned just like strength, just like healthy habits, just like healthy eating skills. It's not something you can just throw a switch and have confidence. And this is one of the reasons why it is such a uh, attractive quality to be had because it's something that is very deeply subliminally felt in an individual and it radiates out throughout through our subconscious body language. We can't fake it. In fact, one of the things that screams low confidence is an overcompensation and trying hard of making it look like you're confident. You know, like a classic example is someone who has a good firm handshake. You could tell a lot of someone's confidence by their handshake. They got a limp hand handshake, you know, no confidence there. You've got someone who's trying to crush your hand with theirs when they're shaking their hand. That also screams very low confidence because they're trying hard. They're like, yeah, yeah, come on, you know, kind of thing. But a good, strong, firm handshake, eye contact. These are things that radiate self-confidence. We pick up on it on a subliminal level, which is why it's so attractive because we know it's not try hard. We know it's not being faked. 
and we know it's genuine, real, and authentic about what it says about that individual. Michael's coming in with a comment saying, I have learned that confidence uh, is arrogance that is under control. I like that idea because, yeah, there's a very fine line between confidence and arrogance. You know, it's that old adage of if you're confident in something, you don't necessarily need to project it out into the world. Uh, as the old saying goes, like if you're if you're rich or if you're funny or if you are strong, you don't need to go out and be like, hey, I'm rich. Hey, I'm strong. Hey, look at me. I'm so funny. People love how funny I am. Basically, the old adage is if you're telling people that you're, quote, an alpha male, you're not. It should be something that is just confidently portrayed in your actions, your speech, your behaviors. So understanding that confidence is something that you have to earn only makes it that much more attractive because it's not something you can just band-aid about. It's not something you can have with a product. If I showed up with low self-confidence in a fancy sports car, that fancy sports car now screams insecurity. But if I have self-confidence and I show up at that same sports car, that sports car shouts confidence. It's all about what is genuinely, truly, honestly within. And so we're going to be talking a little bit today on how to bolster these things up to a higher level so you don't have to fake it. You don't have to try and you know make fake it till you make it kind of thing or try any sort of tricks or hacks and a way to appear confident. You will simply be more confident with practicing these methods. So first and foremost, like I said, confidence is earned. Well, how can we earn confidence? Well, to a large degree, confidence comes about through competence. So the more competent you are at something, the more confident you are at the thing. Now, let me give you a bit of a story to illustrate this. So I've been uh, training several women in the social circle that I fell into when I moved back here to Denver. And uh, it was about three or four, you know, like me, middle-aged women or so, about my age. And there was one woman who was like, I'm not going to work out, but I'm going to just watch you guys. And so I've always been friends with these uh, individuals and felt, you know, always kind of good about, you know, what I can do and my posture and language and things around you know, my friends and stuff. But this individual who was, say, who was watching us pulled me aside and she said, okay, Here's the thing I noticed. And I was like, what, you want to work out and stuff? She's like, no. She's like, the Matt Schifferly I saw when you were training everybody, that's the kind of Matt you need to be much more of the time. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, you are a totally different person when you were training people versus when you're just kind of getting together and socializing, watching football on a Sunday afternoon. I was like, I am? She's like, yes, it is totally different. And after thinking about this for a while, I realized, well, of course that's the case because I've always been very awkward and kind of a little bit self-conscious in social situations, uh, even a little bit to a degree. But of course, we'd get together, we'd start talking a little, hi, how's your day? How are you feeling? Okay, very good kind of thing. But as soon as it was go time for the workout, it was <clears throat> game face, training mode, something that I've been doing for two decades now. And of course, I have complete confidence in my ability to train individuals because I have competence in training. Now, of course, when I started out as a trainer, I had very little competence because I didn't know what I was doing as a trainer. And it took years of practice for me to be able to handle new individuals that I hadn't trained in a while or, or ever even and saying, oh yeah, I know exactly what to do. This is no problem. I've totally got this. And I guess that's to a large degree what confidence is. It's just the idea of I've got this. I can handle myself in this situation. But her observation of that change in my confidence level put more of a reference for me of that's what confidence feels like and I need to feel more like that in various circumstances. So the big question then is, well, how do you become more competent in things? And the answer is simply exposure and practice. Lots of it. How do I get more confident being a trainer, you practice and you get your, uh, you know, fingernails dirty being a trainer for a lot more time. Exposure, 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 experience, experience, experience. When you first learned to ride a bike, you weren't confident riding a bike, but eventually you got to the point where you're jumping off of curbs and racing around, uh, you know, dirt tracks and stuff. How did you get there? You just keep 
riding your bike a whole heck of a lot. And there's really not a lot of shortcut to this. Like I said, it's earned. It's earned in the circumstances that you're confident in. So whenever we feel like, oh, I'm just not confident doing this or that or so, one of the best ways to build confidence in that way is just keep going at it a lot, a lot. Because eventually you get to the point where you're not so self-conscious about it. You know, I'll give you another story here. When I started making YouTube videos about 15 years ago, it was absolutely terrifying of for me to just get in front of the camera and hit that red record button. I mean, I would work myself up for hours all afternoon. It's like, I got to make that video. Oh, I'll do laundry first. I got to make that video. Uh, I'm going to meal prep first. Oh, I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to work out first. I get a pump for the camera. It's like, I was always putting it off because I was so scared. And those early videos didn't survive the test of time. But if you saw them, you'd see me just kind of stricken and be like, uh, 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 you know, just lost for words to a large degree and very nervous in front of the camera. And it was like that for many weeks, hell, months on end, every time I tried to say something in front of the camera because I was so camera shy. How did I get over it? Eventually, it's just recording a lot. <laughs> That's all it was. It's just more time in front of the camera, more time in front of the camera, more time in front of the camera. And it's more than that, too. It's also being able to recognize improvement. And that's one of the things that holds people back a lot is when we are self-conscious about something, we're so sensitive to our own flaws and our mistakes. So I hated watching myself on camera. I hated listening to myself and everything. But the fact is, eventually, I got over that little fear intimidation and I started watching myself. And of course, there's all sorts of mistakes I was making. You know, I couldn't maintain eye contact with the lens of the camera. Uh, I was um, uh, like um, um, kind of, um, you know, saying a lot of those words. I forget there's a name for that sort of thing, but I had a lot of those. So once I started taking notes, at least mentally, and thinking to myself, okay, here's how I can speak better. Here's how I can stand better, present the information better. And as long as I felt like I was starting to improve a little bit on what I was doing in front of the camera, that also built my competence. And with more competence, naturally comes confidence to the point where now I can just, you know, hit record on a camera and even halfway through, oh, shoot, that's right. I forgot to turn on the microphone and I don't care. Or like someone will shout my name from the other room. And I'm like, yeah, what do you need? OK, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get to it later. All right. Uh, edit that out. As I was saying, you know, and I would just go into it. But before, if I made even the slightest mistake, I'd be like, oh, the whole take is ruined kind of thing and be so, so beating myself up about it. But the fact is that the more comfortable I got with such mistakes, the more I improved things, the easier it became. And I got more confident because I became more competent. Now, of course, there's no such thing as universal confidence at everything. You can put me in a gym and I'm 100% confident in my ability to handle myself. I can be on a mountain bike or on a ski trail and stuff. Totally confident. No problem at all. Put me on a skateboard. Oh, and I'm going to fall to pieces because I, <laughs> I don't know skateboarding from a hill in Africa. It's like terrible. I have very little confidence on skateboarding. So it's not like you're going to be confident in one area and just be confident universally. Instead, recognizing areas where you're not too confident. And then you can say, okay, I need more exposure, and more practice, more competence in those areas to improve my confidence in those areas. And it just takes time. It just takes time. It just takes practice. Because remember, confidence is earned. You have to earn it through your repetitions. You have to earn it through your practice. And it's not so much a shortcut, but the more you can practice, the better. And it's also very important to recognize that you practice in a place where you feel relatively safe, right? So if you wanted to be a more confident skier, for example, I'm not going to send you down, you know, Mary Jane over here in Winter Park, you know, Cannonball Alley or, you know, Aw Shoots or something where it's like super tough double black diamond, even on the best of days, it's glare ice. No, of course not. I'm going to say, okay, what are you comfortable skiing now? All right. And now we'll ski something a little bit harder or we'll ski the same areas and say, here's how you can ski this better and smoother and stuff. Because if you overcompensate, and you're like, all right, I'm totally terrified of public speaking. I'm going to force myself to do public speaking in front of an auditorium of 3,000 people. You're going to suck. <laughs> There's no two ways about it. And then you're going to be 
beating yourself about it because I sucked in front of all those people. You're right. I'm not good at public speaking or I can't ski because you basically snowballed down a double black diamond and that reinforces you're right. I suck at this. And that only hurts your confidence because it doesn't improve your competence. So make sure that you're doing things in a relatively safe space, some place where you're fine if you totally mess up, where you're okay if you make the most horrific mistake. In mountain biking, we do this all the time, where uh, one of the things that people are very uh, low self-confidence about is when they first start using clipless pedals. This is where you use your shoes and you clip in and it locks you into the pedal. And people get very nervous about that. They're not confident with using it. And ironically enough, the advantage of clipless pedals is it makes you much more confident on the bike because you have four points of control instead of just two where you're holding on the handlebars. So when people are learning this, we say go out into a grassy field and you just clip in, clip out, clip in, clip out, clip in, clip out, just building up that competence of that. And because it's just a grassy field, it eventually, eventually you're going to be like, oh no, and you forget to clip out and you just fall over. But it's just a grassy field. It, it's fine. So then you're like, oh, well, that was a little embarrassing, but it's okay. It's not like you're flying down a gravel road at 20 miles an hour and you forget to clip out and then you have road rash up the entire right side of your body. That's a high consequence fall, right? So you want to have low consequence circumstances. You can get a lot of practice in. And when you get that practice, your competence improves and therefore your confidence as well. Let's get to see with some of these questions here. Michael's saying, yes, confidence is an extremely attractive gift to have. It advises a leadership to a particular domain. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And that's that's one of the things that um, I had to learn very early as a trainer, too, because I was always trying to be the timid trainer, like, okay, let's let's do this exercise. If, if you're up for that, you know, it, it, what are you feeling like doing today kind of thing? And I had a really good uh, mentor years ago. He's like, they show up, you tell them what to do, period. <laughs> like, don't do this wishy-washy, like, okay, well, do you want to do this exercise or we could do this one? You're not a waiter at a restaurant. Like, what can I bring for you, sir? It's like, they show up, they want direction, Matt. So I was like, oh, okay. So then it's like, okay, here we go. They're doing this exercise, that exercise. Of course, I always tell my clients, you want to be able to uh, veto anything. I always tell clients, like, you have full veto power over anything I give you. If I say, let's do lunges, and you're like, no, my knees are shot from a marathon I just ran two days ago. I'm like, okay, then we'll do something else. But I still give them that confident direction rather than the wishy-washy stuff. So leadership, absolutely. Dave is saying, hey, Matt, I've noticed that when I first get a new belt in the martial arts, it takes a little bit until I feel like I've earned it. Did this happen to you? Uh, not too much, not so much. I do feel uh, like it takes a little bit of breaking in. Uh, so to speak. Uh, for me, or at least here in Taekwondo, you learn a new, what we call patterns. I guess a lot of people call them forms in other martial arts, but patterns a set routine that you do on the floor and uh, you get your belt and then you learn your new pattern. And I always, for me, I always felt like I get in a belt, but I, I'm not really a blue belt or a red belt until I've learned the new pattern. Once I learn the new pattern, then I feel like, okay, now I'm a, a full on red belt kind of uh, level at it. And it all depends kind of on your perspective too, because I would get a red belt and then I would learn the red belt pattern. And some people would call that the black stripe pattern, the next belt level up, because that's the pattern you do to earn the black stripe. I'm like, no, that's the pattern you do because you got your red belt. So it was kind of just a perspective thing, but yeah, it's, it, they give you the belt because you've earned it at that point. You have become that level when they hand it to you, when you've been promoted. And at that point you have earned it. Uh, according to the rules and the regulations of the school and the martial art. And so there's no need to feel like you haven't quite earned it yet. But I know what you mean. A lot of times people feel like they're unworthy of the belt. You know, we've had uh, black stripes because that's the level before black belt in Taekwondo. We've had black stripes, we stayed black stripes for years. And the instructors are like, it's time to test already. Like you have, you're more than ready. But in their mind, they think that black belt is some sort of high precipice pedestal um, apex level to achieve. And of course, it's not really when you're getting your black belt. It feels like that. But when you look back, you're like, oh, black belt's like graduating to high school. <laughs> it's a, just a higher level of education. It's not really 
a, a super high level. It just means you're fairly proficient in the martial art and you're not a beginner anymore. It doesn't mean you're an expert. It means you're a beginner. You're no longer a beginner. So uh, the ability to advance also depends on your perception of your abilities relative to that. And it's often relative to what you think that belt signifies. And it's usually overinflated. <laughs> it's usually overinflated. Ah, got to have tea on a Saturday afternoon. Jen Zem, it's good to see you again. Uh, starting a two-hour lecture in how to dress for winter service in my boxers before 800 men cured my angst for speaking lecturing for me. Boy, that'll do it. <laughs> well done, my friend. Well done. Yes, because sometimes that's a good way to go about it, too, is you put yourself in a situation, and after that, you're like, well, can't get any worse than that. Or <laughs> can't get any more... Uh, exposed than that. So then it's uh, all uh, relative from that point on out. Jackie Wacky, uh, uh, sorry, I mispronounced it. J Jackie Wacky, Ugh, I can't pronounce that today. Uh, hey Matt, speaking of confidence, I feel so satisfied with my workout today because it's the first time in months uh, understood to what I need to improve right in my log. Thanks, you have uh, to you, they have purpose. Absolutely fantastic. So happy to hear that. We're not just working for the sake of work. We have direction. We have purpose. And that is a big part of confidence is knowing exactly what you want, knowing exactly what you're trying to achieve. That is huge because a lot of times you ask people, well, what do you want? Like a kid sitting on Santa's knee, what do you want for Christmas? And a lot of times people just stare at you like deers in the headlight going like, I don't know what I want. Like, what do you want in a relationship? What do you want in your workout? What do you want in a new job? And a lot of people, they don't know because they've never thought to say, this is what I want. This is what I don't want. And that's a basic characteristic of confident individuals. A confident individual has no problem saying no to something that doesn't align with their goals. You try and sell them something or you're like, how about this exercise? How about that exercise? No. Now, it's perfectly fine to be like, I don't know what I want. So play the field. Try a lot of different things. Take a lot of classes in school kind of stuff. But the more you experience and the more competence you start to build up in certain areas, the more you're going to be able to identify exactly what you want. And that's in itself a superpower these days. Because we've got stuff vying for your attention, trying to pull you in a million directions every single day. But when you go into the gym and you're like, I'm going to do X, I'm going to do Y, and this is my objective, suddenly that big gym with a million pieces of equipment largely becomes superfluous. And you're like, I need that pull-up bar, I need that barbell, and I need that kettlebell. Here I go. And it gives you direction and focus. And that is definitely the mark of a confident individual. Congratulations, my friend. Very good. All right, building confidence. Number two, so competence builds confidence. Number two, the, 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 or the, the third point, because the first point was confidence is earned. Confidence is earned, point number one. Point number two, competence builds confidence. Number three is the power of self-sufficiency. Now, this is a very important one, and somehow I learned this one from a fairly early age, is that I needed to be very self-sufficient from a, a very early time in my life when it came especially to fitness. Like if I can't rely on myself, I'm screwed. <laughs> like I can't rely on a gym or a coach or a trainer or someone to make me do my work. I was just uh, listening or uh, speaking with uh, someone in Australia who's developing a new app. We're looking at maybe having it uh, in alignment with a micro workouts approach. And the whole design behind the app is that the app kind of tells you what to do throughout the day. It's like, okay, five minute push up break or something like that. And it's about focus. It's about giving you directions and stuff. And I had to be honest with you. I think this has a lot of value, but I don't think it has any value for me because I don't need to be told to do my push ups. I've never been needed to be told, go and do your Taekwondo patterns kind of thing. Because I've learned from a very early age, like, if I can't rely on myself, I'm screwed. <laughs> I am absolutely up a creek if I can't make it happen for myself. So I've always kind of developed a little bit of that self-discipline for myself. And that's a mark of self-confidence as well. 
And another thing that helps to develop this is solving your own problems. And I'm a, if you watch some of my videos in fitness and figuring out what works best for you, I'm a big fan of this one. Don't go online and be like, okay, so should I do cardio first or should I do strength training first in my workout? Now, if you go online, you're going to get a million different opinions. None of them matter worth a bean. And you're going to get different perspectives and everything. And you're not probably going to get anywhere. But there's so much in our fitness culture and just society at large where it's like, oh, someone else has to tell you the answer. Someone else needs to give you the program. Someone else has to lead you by the hand because heaven forbid you do it for yourself or figure it out for yourself. And there's even a lot of messages out there that tell us to distrust ourselves. With a lot of fundamentalist approaches, we often portray the individual as the enemy. Oh, you can't trust yourself around junk food. Oh, you're going to be addicted to, to sugar. And so you got to follow this special diet to save you from yourself. You find that type of rhetoric all the time with fundamentalist approaches to a religion and politics and leadership and companies and stuff like that. Like you are the sorry sinner. You're worthless. You're nothing. You can't do anything for yourself. Therefore, you need the leader. You need the uh, political party. You need the religion. You need whatever to save you from yourself. This is not a good way to build self-confidence because it basically keeps you into this state of low self-esteem of you can't do it for yourself. You're worthless. You can't make choices. You can't trust yourself. You can't be on your own. So therefore, you need something external in order to protect you from yourself. But this is not true. This is what people with low self-esteem believe. People with high self-esteem will use coaches, absolutely, and mentors and stuff to say, I need you to help me through troubled spots, give me ideas and stuff. But at the end of the day, if you said, okay, you need to learn to build a birdhouse and you have no idea how to do that, they're like, no problem, I'll figure it out. I will make it happen. I'll find a way. I'll, I'll figure it out. And that's a very good quality to have in their mind is I will figure this out. I can make this work for myself. I'm going to solve my own problems. And this is something that I touched on in a video that I made touching on the subject uh, last week, where it's like one of the best ways to build self-confidence is to solve your own problems. Like, oh, I just can't seem to get up in the morning. Okay. Don't turn to the internet. What can you do? What can you do to get up in the morning better? Because the mind is an amazing problem-solving machine that we so frequently do not use. We are, we're always taught, oh, the answer's out there on the internet. Someone's going to give me the answer and lead me by the hand to save me from myself. It's like, solve your own damn problems. Figure it out for yourself. If you're totally stumped, yes, ask questions and get some ideas. But figure things out for yourself. Because the more you learn to trust yourself with difficult situations, the more confidence you're going to have. And that builds on itself. And again, it's something that only comes through practice and repetition. It's like, I can't seem to figure this thing out. How do I do this? And the more problem solving you do for yourself, the more confidence you're going to have in those circumstances. All right. Mariano is coming on with a good question. I like the new avatar there, Mariano. Very nice. And Pupper. Is that a black lab? Very cute. Hey, Matt, in gyms, uh, the lack of confidence is cemented by the looks of the arrogant. Oh, yes, absolutely. And a lot of times, don't forget, it is uh, largely imagined, too. You know, a lot of times, <laughs> I used to uh, have a, a good buddy who was huge. I mean, not just muscular, just NFL linebacker, big, like 380 pounds, big kind of thing. And whenever someone new was in the gym, they'd be like, I don't know about that guy. He's kind of scary and everything. But of course, he's just this big teddy bear. He was, he loved everybody. And a lot of times if someone new is in the gym, they're like, they're all looking at me. Yeah. Cause you're new. <laughs> They've been here for five years. They know everybody here. You put one new person in there and suddenly it's like, Oh, wonder who that is. And it's not because they're like, Oh, they're looking at me. They think I'm out of shape. They think I'm weaker. No, you're just new <laughs> kind of thing. So it's uh, largely imagined, and it's largely for the reasons we don't think. There was a very good episode. I think it was um, Hidden Brain, uh, the, the podcast. I think it's also on NPR. And they had this one segment where they talked about how 
our perceptions of what people think of us are usually way off, way, way off. Like there were people on the show are like, oh yeah, I worked with this one person for years and I was sure they hated my guts. I was sure they hated everything about me. And then come find out years later, they were like, you were always my favorite. I always liked working with you. I was like, what? I thought you hated me. Like, why would you think that? You know, it's like, well, there was at one time you gave me that look and I thought for sure you hated me and stuff. So usually, unless there's direct communication, like someone comes up to you and they're like, you're ugly, I hate you, I don't want to ever see you. Unless it's something clear like that, normally our perception of how we think people perceive us is way off, <laughs> way, way, way totally off. So we shouldn't have too much of that inner monologue going like, they think this about me, they think that about me. And again, that's usually a sign of a fairly low confidence uh, scenario. Like you walk into the gym with full confidence, you know, nobody cares. You, nobody's thinking anything about you. And even if they are, so what? You don't care because you're confident. But when you have low self-confidence, you're going to think that even if it's not happening. So a low self-confident individual is always looking for that external validation uh, in order to prop things up. But ironically, that external validation doesn't help because, again, it's reinforcing that message that you need external sources to solve your problems for you. You can't rely on yourself. I need the likes. I need the positive comments. I need people to like what I'm doing in order to know that what I'm doing is worthwhile versus a confident person is like, yeah, I like doing this. How many likes did you get? I don't know. I got some. Doesn't matter. You know, They don't really care too much about that because they have that self-validation to it as opposed to the external, which doesn't matter how much external you get, because if you don't have it internally, it's never going to be enough. San Diego, good to see you again. Hey, Matt, I'm not being able to connect with my lats during pull-ups, but I do feel them during rows. Should I stop doing pull-ups and just do rowing exercises? No, I wouldn't do just the rows. I would focus on them, though. Anything that you feel the muscle working more is probably doing you more benefit for sure. But I would bet anything it's because you're just not depressing your shoulders enough when you're doing your pull-ups. So when you're hanging and you're doing your pull-ups, your, your shoulders are elevated slightly, which is normal when you're hanging. And then when you start to pull up, you may even be depressing your shoulders a bit, but it's just not enough. And therefore, your lats aren't quite engaged because one of the jobs of your lats is to forcefully depress your shoulders. But because a row is horizontal, it's a lot easier to get that forceful depression because you're not working too much against gravity, and that's why you're getting your lats on. So what I would do is make the row your primary pull chain exercise for the next several weeks, but keep practicing your scapular pull-ups, you know, hanging from a bar and just doing pull-ups with just the shoulder blades. And then once a week or so, try the pull-ups and remember to pack and pull. So you pack the shoulders, then you pull yourself on up. And eventually that scapular depression will get strong enough and it will carry over to your pull-ups and you'll have it with both. And then you're, you're not having to compromise by leaving an exercise out of your repertoire. Robbie is asking, hey Matt, I'm thinking about how to program isometrics. What are the benefits of dynamic exercises for long-term strength and health? Paul Wade seems to suggest they're not necessary. Oh, furthest thing from it, my friend. Absolutely, they are fantastic. Uh, so a lot of times with rhetoric around something, especially when we're excited about something, uh, you may even have gotten that from me many times, because in many cases, I've even made the claim that I believe that isometrics in many ways are the most superior strength training method, bar none. Like if you just came to me and you're like, I have a pure blank slate, what can I do to build strength as quickly as possible? I definitely would say isometrics. But that doesn't mean that I would say that dynamic stuff is not of value. Of course, it's very much of value, huge value, because as great as isometrics are, dynamics still have a unique value from isometrics. So there's certainly good things for it. And to me, I'm always just simply, yeah, just switch and swatch, mix and match, however you like. One day do isometrics, one day do uh, dynamics, or you can do it with a grind style approach where the isometrics are a good way to uh, warm up for a tension control phase. You could even do it with strength uh, phase, however you like to do it. Because remember that the key with a good workout is the fundamental objectives, not the exercises. Your results don't come from what exercise you do. They come from whether or not you hit the fundamental objectives of the training that you're trying to do. 
So if you're making your muscles contract harder, you're gonna get stronger, regardless of what exercise method you're using. So usually when I uh, have people saying, which one should I do? I'm like, just go on preference. Some days you feel more like isometrics. Some days you may feel like dynamic efforts. I go back and forth many times myself where for several weeks, I'm like, I'm just doing isometrics like crazy. And then after that, I'll be like, yeah, dips and pull-ups are calling my name again. I'll do that for a while kind of thing and go back and forth and so on. So you go based more on preference than anything else. As long as you are still accomplishing the fundamental objective of your workouts for your goals, you can do whatever you like. You can do mostly isometrics, mostly dynamic, or mix and match, however you prefer. All right, let's see what else we can bring in here before we get into the last point here for building confidence. Quidid says, with confidence, I find it very important to also be aware to avoid overconfidence. It's often hard to determine when it was overconfidence. Yes, I, I always think of a quote from Bruce Lee when he talked about this. He summed it up very nicely. He was talking with someone, I think it was a reporter or something. And he's like, I don't know what you want me to say. He's like, on one, because this is at the height of his fame. And he's like, if I say I'm no good and I suck as a martial artist, you know I'm lying. But on the other hand, if I say I am good and I'm really, really fast and I'm one of the best out there, you think I'm confident and overconfident and arrogant. So which is it? Like, where do you want me to land? And in that case, it, it's very helpful to always state things in a very matter of fact way. Like, I'm a good skier. I can ski anything, right? I, you put me on any kind of mountain and f with the exception of maybe like super extreme, like cliffs and everything like that, you put me on anything over at, at uh, Winter Park, I can ski it. It's no problem. Now, that's just simple fact because I've skied everything on Winter Park. There's no area there I haven't skied. So that's not me being arrogant or overconfident. It's just simply stating the facts that I can and I have skied everything at Winter Park. Now, am I Olympic level skier? Of course not. No, you put me in uh, that kind of group and I'm going to get destroyed. But that doesn't mean I'm a bad skier, right? Same thing with mountain biking. I tell people all the time, I'm a fast mountain biker. When I was racing, especially, I was like, I'm very fast. I'm like, how can you say you're very fast? You came in the middle of the pack. I'm like, those guys are faster. <laughs> they were faster still. Doesn't mean I'm slow. It means they were faster than I was kind of thing. So it's always about being sort of humble with your confidence because you want to be confident, but you want to own your shit. You want to be able to own what you can and cannot do. And that leads me into the fourth point of building confidence, which is own your weaknesses. So oh, uh, unconfident people or very low self-esteem and low confidence people, they're always trying to overcompensate for a weakness. Or if you accuse them of having a weakness, then they'll fight you against it. Like, what are you talking about? This is bullshit. Blah, 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 blah. And they'll make excuses and stuff. Confident people understand their weaknesses. They know where they fall short and they're not afraid to admit to it at all. I think it was Peter Dunkel. Drink, no, no. Am I pronouncing that right? Dunklage. Ah, damn it. I see, there you go. Like, I can't know, I don't know his name fully. You know, I wish I did. Please put it in the comment section so I can get corrected. But I'm not trying to just muddle through it and pretend I know what I'm talking about because clearly I don't, uh, you know, because I don't really know that much about pop culture. It's not exactly a strength and during trivia night for me and things like that. But he said something to the equivalent of if you own your weaknesses, they can't be used against you kind of thing. And that is very true because confident people will readily admit when they don't know what they're talking about. So again, another story. When I started working retail and back in uh, college, that was what I did, particularly bike shops. I hated saying, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. So it would make up answers. And of course, that's the worst thing you can do because my boss would then come down on me as like, you told the customer this and that's not right. Why are you telling the customer incorrect information? That's terrible. It's like, if you don't know, just say you don't know. It's perfectly fine to say you don't know but I didn't have much self-confidence in myself at the time, so I felt I had to overcompensate for it. So owning your weaknesses, I was talking about confidence comes from competence, but it's also from recognizing when you are incompetent at something. Like, I don't know how to do this. I'm not the best at doing this. Now, it doesn't mean you're like trying to be 
overly humble. Like sometimes you'll find those individuals like I'm worthless, I'm nothing, and I can't do anything right. That's that's a a, a sign of arrogance right there. That's that's a hidden hidden um, arrogance. Uh, arrogance isn't the right word I'm looking for. Um, pride. It's a hidden pride. You see that sort of thing. It's like no, own your stuff. Be honest about it. If I'm good at something, I'm going to say I'm good at it. If I'm average, I'm going to say I'm average. And if I stink at it and I'm terrible, like riding a skateboard, I'll I'll readily admit, like, yeah, I don't know how to do anything on a skateboard. If I can just stand on a skateboard that's standing still, I'm happy. And there's, again, an honesty there. It's a genuine realism that helps people respect you all the more because you show that I've got a thick skin. I've got emotional armor that you can sling, you know, stones and arrows my way, accusing me of X, Y, and Z, and it can't hurt me because someone could say, hey, you you suck at, you know, Olympic lifting, Matt. And I'm like, yeah, I know. I'm a, I suck at Olympic lifting. Trust me, that's the last thing you want me coaching you on. Now, if you want me coaching you on calisthenics, I'm your guy. But yeah, there's a lot of things in fitness I'm not very good at. So you can't accuse me of being bad at Olympic lifting when I know I'm bad at Olympic lifting. I don't have videos on it. I don't coach people in it. So I can't be, you know, emotionally hurt and accused by that because, yeah, of course I can't. Exactly. Let's get to a couple of other questions here. I don't want to fall too much behind. Alex Amini. Hey, Matt, cycling question. Oh, good. I'm trying to engage more of leg muscles. Recently unlocked ability for hamstring engagement. Awesome. Feels amazing. How should pedaling ideally be? Tension shared across all muscles? Yeah, to a degree. But keep in mind that when we're talking about muscular engagement, that doesn't mean tensing things as hard as they possibly can be. Because especially in athletic pursuits like cycling, if you tense everything up, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> you can't even pedal like that. So there's a degree of relaxation that has to happen as well during the pedal stroke. Now, of course, hamstrings are very much engaged on the pull through at the bottom of the pedal stroke. And when you're lifting up, especially if you're wearing those clipless pedals. Uh, so what you want to be doing is thinking kind of like push, pushing into the pedal with your quads and your glutes and your calves towards, you know, the top to the bottom and then hamstrings pulling through on the way up. So you've kind of got this front back, front back, front back. The front of the pedal stroke is primarily the front of the leg. The back of the pedal stroke is the back of the leg sort of thing. And a good way to practice this is uh, when you're warming up and maybe you're mountain biking and you're just in the parking lot or something like that, flat pavement. Or if you're just on a road bike and you're just kind of starting off, stay in a very low gear. So that way you can keep it around 90 to 100 RPMs and you're just pedaling lightly. You're not trying to engage the muscles very hard with a lot of resistance, like you're climbing up a hill at like 75 RPMs. You want to keep the RPMs relatively high so you can just get the muscles feeling loose and feeling good about having a smooth pedal stroke. Because when your tension isn't very good, that's when you've got this type of stomping, stabbing motion on the pedals versus a smooth cycling cadence to it. Uh, hopefully that all makes sense for you. And again, very, very much uh, comes from practice. Lots of practice in that regard. Coming on in. I'm sorry, man. I cannot pronounce that name. That is a crazy name. Look at that. Hell of an avatar though. Wow. Very, very striking. Anyway, Matt, long time sub here. Thank you very much. Do you have any proprioception improvement advices? Uh, so a good way to improve proprioception is with crawling movements. Uh, the animal flow, Mike Fitch, you know, global body weight training, uh, GMB elements, bear crawls, uh, monkey, all those sorts of things. So what that does is it requires all four limbs relative to the floor and you're constantly moving things around. So your arms and your limb, your legs, your limbs, your body orientation, everything's changing constantly what's going on. It also is really good for the vestibular system uh, and your balance and your orientations. So just using it as a warm up, and you don't need like 20 different crawling movements, just one or two will probably do you. But uh, that's a good way to develop that proprioception because the floor is giving you constant feedback as to where your limbs are. And you're also changing where your limbs are in space in multiple planes of motion. 
And so you get all of that going and it's just a ton of information coming into your nervous system telling you proprioception is improving and you're becoming much more aware of where things are, weight distribution, neuromuscular activation, everything. Crawling is one of those things that just does so much and it takes so little to be able to do it. Frederico, hey Matt, uh, nice to be here on your live again. Thank you very much for coming on in. Always grateful to receive your wisdom. I appreciate it, guys. Appreciate you guys being patient too because I know I haven't been doing these lives very much over the past uh, several weeks, but uh, it's very much... Uh, the, the thing that you want to be uh, aware of is changes are always happening on the the um, the uh, Instagram. I always post those things. Dave is asking, I've heard a true humility has recognized both one's shortcomings, but also assets. Absolutely. So I, I used to know this one lady who, no matter what you told her, she could never receive compliments, right? That's a good sign of someone who's confident. So I'm, tell them, nice shirt, and they'll say, thank you very much. That's a confident person. Tell them nice shirt, and they're like, "Oh, this old thing now is I, I don't look good in anything. In fact, I I should be ashamed to be seen out in public." That's not confidence. <laughs> That's not humility either. That's false pride. That's just trying to put on a show, an act, right? It's not real, and that's why people are turned off by it. Is I think emotionally, we humans have this very very clear understanding, or at least attraction to genuine honesty. You know, it's when we feel like someone is being unfiltered around us. They're not mean, they're not nice or anything. They're just real. And a lot of times when someone is willing to pay and receive a compliment and they appreciate it, that's genuine. It's like, this is how this person honestly feels. But when we feel like we're trying to hide our feelings or hide our intentions, that's that makes us feel like this is suspect. And it's, it's a very big, uh, it's not very attractive. It's a something that uh, uh, isn't very uh, welcoming for other social interactions. Cyril saying, hey Matt, strength training is often recommended for cycling and running, but do you think bodyweight training is a good alternative? Greetings from France. Absolutely, in fact, I have a book on it. Uh, it's down below, of course, in, in the comment section. I have bodyweight training for cycling, and uh, it applies just as well to running, hiking, other endurance, sports as well. And the reason why I wrote that book is because, yeah, a lot of people, when it comes to the endurance athlete, go about strength training in a total bass backwards way uh, because they either do way too much of it and they're training like a bodybuilder. And the thing about endurance training particularly is it uses a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of other resources which is why a lot of endurance athletes don't do strength training because they're like, I'm already spending a ton of time and energy running or cycling or whatever. Now you want me to spend even more for several hours in the gym? This is ridiculous. Or people are like, fine, I got to do it. And I'll talk to them and like, so what are you doing in the gym? And they'll lay out this workout program. I'm like, when are you ever on the bike then? When are you ever training <laughs> for the actual thing? Because don't forget as an athlete, the bulk of your performance will always come from doing the actual sport, not the supplemental strength training. That's just the cherry on top. So I wrote that book because it's like, these are the exercises you want to focus on. These are the supplemental ones if you want to do a little bit more there. And it's a very quick and uh, very focused way to approach what's most important for the strength and the qualities you need on the bike or when you are using... Um, you know, running and all, all these other qualities. So it's, it's not something that you want to be able to overdo, but it's certainly important. You don't want to make the same mistake I did where I was like, oh, I don't need to work my legs. I'm a cyclist. But then again, it, you could also be like, well, you do work your legs because you're a cyclist. <laughs> you know, I wish I had known that back in the day because when I was racing uh, my peak in college, I didn't do any strength training for my legs. Oh, total regret at this point. I probably would have done a lot better if I had done more strength training and less of the cardio, especially in the off season uh, during the winter. I would have had a hell of a lot better performance. Uh, but uh, yeah, you have to live life forward. You can't be uh, too wistful about what, what could have been or should have been and all those sorts of things. And that's another thing that I've noticed about confidence as well. As I've become more confident, I'm less attached to my past. Now, I used to have a lot of history where everything was about 
you know, the good old days, the, the, what I did in the past and, uh, you know, growing up in Vermont, especially uh, kept with the same friends all throughout high school, college and young adult, you know, a lot of the old traditions, you know, whatever I was doing, you know, every summer in high school and college, I was still doing when I was like 30, 35 and everything. And a lot of it was still very good. It wasn't like I was being pressured into it or anything, but I've always noticed that confident people move forward in life. They're moving forward into new phases, new relationships, new businesses, new habits, new developments. They're always looking forward and saying, okay, what do I do to improve things? But people who struggle with confidence are always looking kind of to the past. Like, oh, you know, you get, you get together with them on uh, uh, you know, a social occasion and all they talk about is remember when yada, yada. Remember when we did this? Remember, you know, as they say, remember when is the lowest form of conversation. It's like this guy is living in his past. It's like um, uh, Uncle Leo from Napoleon Dynamite. You know, he's like, oh, when I was playing football in school and that was my glory days. And like, dude, you're like 35 now. <laughs> like, what do you have going on now? He's stuck in the past. And it's true what they say. Someone who is not propelled towards a more purposeful and hopeful future will always be returning to their past. And I've noticed that myself a lot because I used to be like that a whole heck of a lot. And as I've become more confident in my own life, I've noticed myself thinking about and like having nostalgia and reminiscing about the past less and less and less. Not because I'm trying to turn in, uh, my back to it. It's just simply because what I'm doing now and what I'm hoping to do in the next several months has more of my attention because I'm confidently moving forward into new things and new projects as opposed to, oh God, I wish I could go back in time and stuff like that. I give a lot of references in what I talk about with like my days cycling and bike racing and stuff like that. But, you know, I'm doing different biking activities now. I'm going to go mountain biking over at North Table right after this. Is it a race? No, because it's a different form of mountain biking that I do now. Something that's a lot easier and more rewarding for me uh, now. So it's one of those things that uh, is just, it's an interesting thing to observe. You know, as you get more confident, you start to become more aware of when low confidence shows its head. It's kind of a funny thing how you advance in some areas in your life and where you were becomes much more apparent. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I was like that, but it felt normal at the time, right? So it's, it's just an interesting observation. But let's quickly recap here before I let you folks go. So number one, confidence is something you have to earn. It's not something you can hack or get some sort of a short like course or something you can just learn from the internet. It comes primarily through competence and, and experience. And I know it can be hard to gain those things, especially when you have low self-esteem. So make sure that you are putting yourself in a place where you can gain that stuff in a safe, relatively comfortable environment, not where there's high consequences if you mess up because you are going to mess up. And that's not a bad thing. That's not a bad thing at all. Uh, Self-sufficiency is also very key. Solving your own problems. You know, be a problem solver. One thing I forgot to mention earlier that I had mentioned in that YouTube video is one of the great things that you can do to kind of train self-sufficiency in problem solving is the hobby of puzzle solving. Puzzle solving keeps putting you in that scenario of like, I don't know what to do here. I am completely at a loss. I'm completely stuck. And you've got to figure it out. You have to figure out how do you solve this thing, right? And that's a situation that most of us do not like to put ourselves in. We don't want to be in in some way. Again, we look to the internet to solve our problems for us. And puzzles are a very safe place to say, well, you've got to figure it out for yourself. And when you do, that helps to build up that ability of problem solving skills, which is a whole nother thing that I think is starting to erode these days more than our attention span due to the internet, but those who can solve problems that have problem solving skills, that's a new modern day superpower. And then finally is owning your weaknesses, owning your weaknesses, being very transparent and honest about such things and being open you know, about your, not so much weaknesses, but just the things that you have, uh, you know, kind of gone against you a little bit in life. It's like, okay, yeah, nobody's perfect. Everybody's fallen down and got an egg on their face from time to time. It's totally normal. It's it, acceptable. 
And yeah, the people who are pointing and laughing at you when you fall down and you spill your lunch at the lunch tray, they're the ones who have the low self-esteem. As someone with good self-confidence will come and help you up and say, here, have my sandwich. You know, looks like you your lunch is on the floor there kind of stuff. Self-confidence is a new superpower, my friends. And it's dwindling more day and day, which means that the more you have of it, the more valuable it will become. And the more powerful you become, not only for your own life, but also for the lives of your friends and family and those you love. And it improves your quality of life as well. So it's a roundabout way. We're not talking just push-ups and building stronger muscles today, but it really does have a relationship with everything as well. So, all right, folks, thank you so much for listening and watching as always. Super appreciated. And uh, I will be doing this next week. Don't forget to check out all the sponsors for the equipment and the RDP library down below in the description. And I will talk to you folks next time. Till then, be fit and live free.